All right, so on Friday, we talked about the cell theory, okay, and we went over the three points of the cell theory, okay, first point being that all organisms are made up of cells, uh, the second point being okay, that cells carry out the basic functions of the organism, and we said that that is probably the most all-encompassing uh, part of the cell theory. Okay? It's the one that you'll use most often, refer to most often, okay? find a way to work it into answers in a written response item on a unit exam, things like that, okay? because that is what they do. Okay? That is their purpose, to carry out the basic functions that your body requires. Okay? That is uh, exchange of gases, uh, metabolism of food, um, production of proteins and fats and things like that, excretion of waste, all of that good stuff. Okay, third thing is that cells are not created. They come from the division of, of existing cells. Okay, and we just kind of started talking about how that cell division process occurs. Okay, that is the copying of the DNA happens first. Okay, and then essentially the cell uh, makes sure that all the DNA gets to both sides and then it splits in half. All right, um, the cell is much less concerned with whether or not all organelles in the cell, that is all the little parts of the cell, um, end up being divided equally. Okay. That is less important for this reason. The cell can always make more. Okay. What the cell can't do is fix a mistake where there's DNA missing. All right. There's DNA missing, the mistake can't be fixed. Whatever was on that DNA, your, your cell can't figure out how to do that. Okay. Because that's the only source of that information. Everybody kind of follow me on that? Okay. Now, obviously it's bad if DNA is missing. Is it also bad if there's too much? Yep. Okay. It can be equally um, catastrophic if there is too much DNA. Okay. There are a lot of disorders, genetic disorders, okay, um, that plague humans that have to do with having uh, too much DNA. Some, um, you know, are we see them, okay, like a person who might have, like, say, Down syndrome, okay, which is uh, trisomy 21. Okay. They have three copies of that chromosome. Okay. That obviously has some very um, obvious and far-reaching effects on them in terms of not just physical development, but also emotional and mental development. Okay, uh, those are all things that don't function quite properly Okay, because there's three copies of that chromosome. There are a lot of other trisomies where there's a third copy of a chromosome. Okay, Most of those result in a miscarriage. Okay, um, The infants that have those disorders simply do not survive, usually to birth, right? because the, the problems associated with those trisomies are too far reaching. Okay, everyone kind of follow me there? So that process, that copying of the DNA process is absolutely critical. Okay, it's critical that that process occurs without flaw. Even if we are, let's say, genetically normal, okay, is it possible for the copying process to still go wrong? Yep, okay, and if it goes wrong, okay, what can that, what disease can that lead to? Yeah. It usually leads to cancer. Okay? Cancer is usually caused by cells that are malfunctioning due to some genetic anomaly, okay? and they essentially start to divide out of control. When they divide out of control, okay, they create a mass or a tumor. Okay? And the way that um, that is, let's say, harmful to you okay, is that those cancerous cells, which are still just your cells, okay? They're, which is why your body has such a hard time fighting cancer, it doesn't see a problem. Okay. You've got all these cells. They're yours. They're part of you. Okay. So it doesn't go after them. It doesn't attack them. Okay. They just start to mass and they start to take away all the nutrients um, from all the healthy cells. Okay. So if you were to, let's say, get a mass on your liver, okay, that mass, because it divides out of control and uses so much energy and nutrients, essentially begins to kill all the healthy cells around it. Okay. And that can lead then to the failure of that organ. Okay. And that's essentially how um, cancer is. Um, going to be harmful to you. That sort of makes sense. Okay, so this genetic copying, pretty important process. Okay, now development of the cell theory. Okay, good thing about biology is we only really have to remember four people. Okay, instead of in chemistry where we had to remember a lot more. All right, so in the, the sort of the first part of the cell theory is the discovery of the cell. Okay. The discovery of the cell was by Hook in 1665, completely by accident, like so many great scientific discoveries. Hook is actually a physicist, which just goes to show that physics is the best science. We discover everything, okay? even if it's by accident and it's biology. Right? He was just doing an experiment with a series of lenses. 
he wanted to see what effect he ha what effect it would have if he put lenses in series, okay, what effect that would have on the path of light. Okay. Um, what he wanted to do was essentially find a way to magnify light okay, or magnify an image using the by altering the path of light as it passed through lenses. Okay, so that's essentially how a microscope works. Right? So a microscope effectively okay, works by having all light coming from a specimen running in parallel lines that we call rays. Right? We want it to pass through a lens. Okay? And when it passes through a lens, it gets refracted. That is, it gets its path gets altered. Okay? The further from the center of the lens that is, okay, the more altered the path will be. Okay? And so we essentially get all these things crossing, but then as they cross and their path is altered, they get further apart. So if I was looking at something, Okay, like let's say something we're going to look at in our microscopy lab, a letter E. Okay, how would it look over on the right-hand side? Not only upside down, but also bigger, right? Because look what's happened to these rays. They're now farther apart. Okay? They're flipped because they've gone through the lens and their path has been altered. But because their path has been altered, if I'm standing over here, okay, I now see a much bigger but upside down e something like that anyway taxing my artistic ability to do that okay so that's kind of the experiment that he was running how can i alter the path of light such that i would create a magnified image of something because that would be a useful thing to do All right now when he had developed this microscope he decided well i need something small to look at for some reason, he had cork on hand. Maybe he drank. I don't know, but he had cork. So he sliced this cork really, really thin, and he set it underneath. Now, what's cork made out of? Wood. Yeah, it comes from a tree. All right now, most cork now is actually synthetic, or they don't even use it. They have like screw-on lids. Even on, like on most wines now, they don't have a cork, okay? uh, because they were using making so much that it was actually they were farming out too much cork in there. So they're trying to go with a synthetic replacement. Anyway, at the time he was around, it was made out of tree. Okay, um, so it would have been full of plant cells. Now the cork that's in a wine cork is dead, obviously. Right. So what he saw, magnified under the microscope, was all these little empty rooms. That's what he thought they were, anyway. Empty little rooms, kind of like a prison. Hence the name cells. Okay, they were empty little rooms like a room in a prison. Okay, they're empty rooms or cells. Okay, uh, so that's where the name came from, and it stuck, even though obviously he was looking at, you know, he wasn't a biologist, right? He was looking at something that was dead. If he was to look at living cells, obviously there would be a lot more in them. Now, was his microscope like super effective? No, it only magnified 30 times. A good magnifying glass can do that. Right, but um, it was still sufficient to show something that would not have been visible to the naked eye. Okay, so Hook is kind of the first part of the cell theory because he he discovered that cells exist. All right, so that's his contribution. Made the first microscope okay, and uh, discovered cells exist. Okay. Um, from there on, people tried to improve on the design of the microscope, make it so that it could magnify even more. Okay, and a guy named Anton von Leeuwenhoek came along, and he built this microscope you see him holding in that picture. Um, thankfully, that design did not catch on. Um, it was effective at greatly magnifying because you would project the image onto a screen at a distance, okay, which means essentially the further away the screen is, provided you have enough light, the larger the image could conceivably get. Um, now, Again, you needed a dark room with one very strong light source to shine through your specimen because your specimen sat on top of this little thing. It, it's hard to see it, but it kind of looks like this. There's kind of a depression, but it would be like three-dimensional. Okay? And so your sample would sit in there and the light would go through it and then pass through the lens and be diverted okay? and uh, off it would go. So while yes, that worked, it wasn't really practical or easy to use. Okay? But what he saw were that Cells were not empty little rooms like Hook thought they were. Okay, he looked at living cells. Right, that was the big difference between what he and Hook did. Hook only 
looked at dead cells because he's like, sweet, my microscope works. That's all I care about. He's not looking at anything else because he's not a biologist. Okay. Whereas Anton von Leeuwenhoek was a biologist. He was looking at living organisms under the microscope. Okay. So he would, you know, prick his finger and look at the blood cells. Okay. He would look at all the stuff that lives in pond water. Okay. That would have probably entertained him for a long time because lots of stuff lives in pond water. Okay. Somehow he got sperm cells from a bull. Don't ask me how. He's obviously very brave. Okay. Um, yeah, so he looked at all of these things okay, and discovered that, yeah, cells seem to be in a lot of things. Cells are very common. Okay. Next step was these two scientists here in 1839, so still a very long time ago. Okay. Matthias Schleiden and Theodor Schwann, okay, two Swedish scientists okay, who took the work of Leeuwenhoek and other scientists like that and said, People are discovering that basically anything that's alive seems to be made of cells. Let's go with that idea. These were the guys who proposed the original cell theory. Okay? Their hypothesis was something like this. If cells are the basic unit of life and samples from a wide variety of organisms are viewed under a microscope, then cells will be found in all of them. Okay? Simple hypothesis. Took them years to prove because they had to collect tissue samples from a very wide variety of plants, animals, fungus. Okay? Um, even for them, they were looking also at bacteria, okay? things like that. They found that, yes, in fact, cells are the basic unit of life. Cells were part of every living organism they looked at. Were all cells the same? No, but they were there in some form. All right, so they had much better equipment. It was able to magnify up to 600x. They would have had what's called an oil immersion lens, okay, that uh, they're kind of finicky to use. Our microscopes don't have them, okay? Um, but you, if you go on to university, it's a type of lens you might use in a university lab. Okay, it can magnify, like say, up to about 600 times. Our microscopes can magnify to 400, okay, which is sufficient for our purposes. All right, so Sliden and Swan, okay, they proposed the original cell theory, okay, that is their big contribution. They are the ones who came up with the cell theory. Okay, question there. All right. Now, as we got better at looking at cells, our equipment improved. Okay, we have all kinds of different types of microscopes now. Okay, and we're going to look at some of those different types. We noticed that there were differences and similarities in the cells between all organisms. Okay, what do you suppose is more prominent? Okay, like do we see more similarities or more differences if we're looking at a wide variety of organisms? Yep, more similarities. Okay, we have our cells or all cells have far more in common than they have different. Okay, which leads us to believe that all life that contains cells likely evolved from a single common ancestor a very, very long time ago, even several billion years ago. Okay, everybody with me there? Okay, because of all these similarities, not just structure, okay, but it's also processes. Okay, because of all the different processes that are present in a cell, okay, and those cells or those cell processes being present in a wide variety of organisms, okay, that would lead us to believe that's not by accident. Okay, and it's far more likely that they came from a shared ancestor than that plants, animals, fungus, and bacteria all evolved the exact same process separately. Okay, that's far less likely than they all evolved from a single common ancestor that had that process. All right, follow my logic on that. No, I'm not challenging the Bible at all. And I will go over that, actually. I have a whole lesson on that a little bit later. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Yes, because in the story of creation, everything is meant to be taken as an analogy. Yes, we'll go over that, though. Trust me. Hey, that No, it's an important thing, and I, I just I don't have time for it today, but I do have a whole lesson dedicated to it. So I will cover that for sure. Okay, um, questions on that? Okay. All right, um, so just looking at different types of, like different types of tissue from different organisms, okay? This is what a bone looks like, okay? And then this is what the stem of a plant looks like. Those two structures have similar purposes. They need to support weight, okay? Do they have, other than, you know, like 
some you know difference like one has blood vessels and the other doesn't do they have some structural similarities like a dense central core okay and then cells surrounding all right again this is a process by which things usually happen okay if we're trying to do a similar purpose then structures are going to be similar okay all right now looking at a plant cell and an animal cell side by side obviously plants and animals are quite different Okay, we get our energy in different ways. Plants use photosynthesis, animals have to eat other things. Okay, um, but when you look at their cells side by side, there's far more in common than there is different. Okay, because the process by which DNA is copied is exactly the same for plants and animals. Okay, the process by which proteins are made, exactly the same between plants and animals. Process by which um, sugar is broken down for energy, exactly the same. Okay, the way that materials are moved within the cell, moved through the membrane okay wastes are excreted all of those processes are identical whether you're looking at a fungal cell plant cell or an animal cell even a bacterial cell okay they will still use the same processes all right that's not by accident okay that's because everything has evolved from a single common ancestor okay uh, so when we're looking at this okay both of those cells have a nucleus okay that's the big purple thing the nucleolus is the smaller purple thing in the middle okay they both have rough endoplasmic reticulum that's the blue stuff okay they both have mitochondria that's those sausage shaped things okay they both have a golgi apparatus that's this kind of orange colored thing okay um, they both have a cell membrane they both have cytoplasm okay lots and lots of similarities where there's differences has to do with usually how they get their energy because animals have to move around to get their energy, their cells don't have a cell wall. It allows them to be flexible okay, and be able to move. Plants stay put. They want to get tall so they can get lots of sunlight. Okay, so they need to have rigid cell walls to help support their weight. Right, so that's kind of where some of the differences are. Okay, also, you see these green things inside the plant cell. We don't have those in animal cells because those are chloroplasts. They contain chlorophyll. They carry out photosynthesis. Don't worry about writing all that stuff down right now. We're going to have a whole lesson on the parts of the cell and what they do. Okay, And you guys will each get a diagram of each of those. Okay. All right. Now, microscopy. Using the microscope. How many people have used the microscope before? OK, good. So the microscopes that you would have used at John Paul II are hand-me-downs. We left them there when we left, because John Paul II used to be Holy Trinity way back in the day. Okay, We moved here in 2006, so imagine how old the microscopes you had down there are. Okay, So these are newer-ish. Okay, um, Now, I'm not going to make you label the parts of a microscope, but you do need to know what the parts are, so when I'm talking about them, you know what I'm talking about. All right, now, for our microscope, Okay, so we have a monocular microscope. That means it only has one eyepiece. Okay, some microscopes are binocular, which means there's two eyepieces. Okay, monocular, easier to maintain. Um, so the eyepiece, okay, does move around so that you don't have to move the microscope around when it's on the table. Okay, so if you have a lab partner, you're on one side. Hey, look at this. Turn it to the other side. All right, rather than doing this. Hey, look at this. Okay, because as soon as you do that, it's going to be out of focus. Okay, that vibration will move the stage enough that it will no longer be in focus when your partner goes to look at it. Plus, everybody's eyes are a little bit different. You're going to have to make tiny adjustments even if you just turn the eyepiece over. Okay, but moving, physically moving the microscope will most certainly move it out of focus. So we want to avoid doing that and just rotate the eyepiece instead. Okay, now this part here. This is the arm. Somewhere along the way, someone's teaching you it's called the neck. It's not. It's the arm. Okay? This is the arm. The whole purpose of the arm is to support the upper structure of the microscope and to help you carry it. Okay? We carry a microscope with two hands. I will repeat that. Two hands are always used to carry the microscope. One on the arm and one on the base. Okay? That way, if somebody bumps you, you won't drop it. Okay? Or as I've seen way too many times, oddly enough, somebody gets hit right here while they're carrying the microscope. What will your hand do? Yeah, you let go. You get hit in the funny bone when you're carrying a microscope, and you're only carrying it with one hand, you're going to lose it. Okay? So we don't want that to happen. Always carry it with two hands. Always be mindful that the cord okay, is also supported. You can see this one's already got a whole bunch of electrician's tape on it, which means it's 
been replaced two or three times. Okay, make sure it is wrapped around the microscope and supported when you carry it because I always see people do this. The whole thing is unraveled and they're walking along like this. And they step on the cord and then they rip the cord out from inside the microscope and that causes them usually to drop the microscope. Yeah. Then they hear the they hear the crashing sound and then the thumping sound then the ambulance sound and then beep beep don't drop the microscope okay so make sure you carry it carefully okay always with two hands now um, there are three lenses on our microscopes okay you will always start with the scanning power lens that is the small short one with the red stripe Okay, that one gives you the widest field of view. All right, allows you to find things. It doesn't magnify very much, only 40 times, okay, but it allows you to find things easily. Once you find something, then you're going to want to move it using the controls for the stage. That's these two dials here. Okay, so if you watch, as I turn those, different parts of the stage move. Okay, that allows me to move the slide because the slide will be held inside the stage clip all right so you just put the slide so you move this thing out put the slide in there let that close the slide will be held in place and then you can move the slide around with this which is way better than what you would have had to do with the old microscopes okay which was move it around with your fingers because every time you touch it with your fingers you move the slide and it goes out of focus okay and it's really annoying so this will make your life a lot easier okay you move it around with these why do you need to move it around well, you need to move it around for this reason. Your scanning power lens has a very wide field of view. All right. When you move up to a higher magnification, you see a smaller area blown up bigger. And then when you go up to high power, you see that much. Now, to you, it, the size of the field of view looks the same because you're seeing the same size circle. But that circle is actually much less area because you've magnified the area that you're looking at. Everyone, follow me here. It would be like if you were at a football game, like let's say you're at like a Stampeders game, okay, and you're trying to find somebody on the other side of the stadium. Would you try to find them with binoculars, or would you try and find a general area to look with your naked eye first? Yeah, naked eye first, okay? Like, especially if they were wearing like a bright yellow shirt, okay? It's something that would make them easy to find, okay? So I would look around and, okay, there's a bright yellow shirt, there's a bright yellow shirt, there's a bright yellow shirt. Okay, now I'm gonna lift up my binoculars and look only at the areas where I see bright yellow shirts. Because if I scan the entire crowd with binoculars, one person at a time, that's gonna take me forever, okay? So we wanna start with a wide field of view, find what we're looking for and get it centered. All right, so when you're looking through the microscope, you'll see a black pointer. It's supposed to be there, okay? It marks where the center of the field of view is. Let's see if you're going, oh, of course, no. It's not as obvious as you would think. I, had, I once had a group bring four different microscopes to me, telling me there was something wrong with them. And finally, I'm like, there can't be something wrong with all four of these. Nobody has that bad of luck. Well, there's this big black thing in the middle. The pointer oh yeah that thing okay it's supposed to be there all right so what you want to do is once you have found something and got it focused you use the stage controls to move it on to the end of the pointer that way when you move to this magnification it'll still be at least close to the center if you don't do that if you leave it out here it'll be out here and you won't see it anymore all right, so you always need to center it before you move up in magnification or you'll lose it, okay? You may lose it anyway, even sometimes when you get it close to the center, right? Because you'll have to refocus when you get to that new magnification. All right, everyone kind of follow there? All right, so there are, like I said, three lenses, okay? The scanning power lens is the red one. It magnifies 40 times. Then there is the low power lens. That's the middle one with the yellow stripe, and then there is the high power lens with the blue stripe. When you are using the scanning power lens, there are two different focusing knobs. The big one 
which we call the coarse focusing knob, and the smaller one here, which is the fine focus knob. Okay, if you look at how much the stage moves here, when I use the coarse focus knob, okay, the stage moves a lot. Like I don't even get a full turn before I'm at the top or the bottom of the movement with that knob. Okay, that's the one you want to use with the with the uh, scanning power, maybe with the low power lens. You do not want to use that one with the high power lens. Okay, for this reason, it is possible to drive the slide through the lens with the coarse focus knob. We've put a brake on here, but sometimes the brakes come loose, okay? And when they do, if you're, you know, looking through your high power lens, I can't get it focused, crack, okay? Just the reason you can't get it focused with the coarse focus knob is it goes too fast, okay? With that much magnification, the stage moves so much with even the slightest turn of this knob that you'll go right through focused and not even see it. All right, so you always want to use the fine focus knob for your fine adjustments or basically anything you're doing with the high powered lens. Okay. Little things like that help to preserve our slides and our microscopes because not only do you usually damage the slide when you do that, but it usually scratches the lens. And no matter how small that scratch is, it's going to look huge through the microscope because the microscope's job is to make small things look bigger. Okay. All right. So that's kind of care of the microscope. They all do have a light source on them. So you have to plug them in, switches on the back. And there is a rheostat here that can allow you to change the brightness. One other adjustment you'll likely have to make at some point is of the condenser diaphragm. Okay, that's this thing here underneath the stage. You open and close it, it's like an iris, okay, that allows more or less light through. Okay, and you may think that seems redundant with the rheostat, but it's actually not. Opening and closing that will improve the contrast of your image. Okay, does everyone know what I mean by contrast? The difference between light and dark? It's one of the adjustments you can usually make on a computer monitor. Okay, um, so you want to, uh, that'll help you improve the contrast if you're looking at something that's not colored. Okay, most of the stuff we look at will be stained, right? And so everything will be a different color, but once in a while we look at something that's not stained, that'll really help you to make things inside of it jump out. All right. I think that covers everything on there. Okay, one other care, kind of care item is cleaning the lenses. Okay, occasionally they get dirty. Okay, um, you know, people are looking through them, eyelashes fall on the lens. Okay, you'll know right away if there's an eyelash on the lens because you'll see this big black thing that's not the pointer. Okay, in your field of view, it's just a eyelash. Okay? It's not the end of the world. Um, but to clean the lens, we have special paper for that. Okay, it is one use only. All right, so you come up, you get a piece of lens paper, okay, and you clean the lens with that lens paper, okay, clean the other ones as well using a different part of the lens paper for each lens, and then throw it away. Because any grit that it picks up, we don't want to scratch another lens. All right, so always make sure you're using lens paper, because I see people do this. That's disgusting, okay? There's so many germs in your mouth. I'm not, I'm not a germaphobe, but that's disgusting, okay? Um, or they're like, oh, well, it's... Okay, um, it, depending on the fibers that your clothes are made out of, even that can be harmful to the lenses. And who knows if you've got grit okay, in your clothes, right? Like you maybe you, know, you leaned up against your car this morning and some of the sand from the road got on your shirt, right? And boom, you got that on the lens and it's scratched. So always use the lens paper, okay? All right, when you start, like we said, you always start with the scanning power lens. When you are done, put the scanning power lens back in position. Not only is that polite and thoughtful for the next person who will want that first, it will also prevent them from assuming it is in position and driving the high power lens through their slot. Okay, because not everybody checks. Okay. All right, so there is some of the stuff to do with using the microscope. Now, also to do with what we have to produce with the microscope, okay, um, we need to be able to identify um, and kind of estimate the size of objects and things underneath the microscope. So this is not in your notes, so you'll need to copy it down. Okay, on our scanning power lens, the field of view, that is the circle you can see, is 4,000 micrometers across, okay? This little thing here is mu. It's the Greek letter M, okay? Because we already used MM for something else. You can't use mm, that's millimeters, okay? This is micrometers, okay? There are 1,000 micrometers in a millimeter, so they are a lot smaller, 
okay, than a millimeter. Okay, so in other words, when you look through the scanning power lens, the distance from one side of the circle you see to the other is four millimeters or 4,000 micrometers. Okay, our low power lens, I don't know why it's missing, okay, but it magnifies 100x, so 100 times bigger than normal, and it is 1,600 micrometers across. Okay, and then our high power lens, which magnifies 400 times, is 400 micrometers across. So the circle you see in there is 400 micrometers across. So it is less than one half of a millimeter. All right, so you're probably thinking, well, that's wonderful. I wrote that down. Why do I need to know that? You need to know that because that's how we estimate the size of objects that we view under the microscope. And I say estimate because that's what we're doing. We're not actively measuring them. We are estimating their size. All right? We have to do that because we're going to make lab diagrams of the things we look at. You're not going to have to draw them. Okay? I only wish that was true when I was your age because I can't draw anything and I had to draw everything by hand. Okay? We have better technology now. Whenever you find something, you get it focused under the microscope, you're going to put your phone up to the microscope and you're going to take a picture of it. Okay? And then we will use the picture to make a lab diagram and I'll show you how to do that. Okay? Uh, maybe today we'll get to it. Okay? Um, but I'll show you how to make that lab diagram so that you can make effective diagrams and we'll label them. I'll show you how to do all of that. Okay? All right, so everybody with me so far? Okay. Um, all right, so to estimate the size of an object, essentially what we do is if I'm looking at something under the high power lens, I know that the distance from here to here is 400 micrometers. So I'm looking at... That's not an egg, it's an amoeba. Okay, I know it looks like an egg, but it's an amoeba. How big is it? about yeah like 100 good enough okay it's 100 micrometers it's just an estimate it took up about a quarter of the field of view so it's about 100 okay i would probably accept anything between 80 and 120 okay maybe a little bit more okay. what if i have that how big is that okay yeah about 250, something like that. Whenever we have something that's oblong, we always measure it on its longest dimension. Okay? That happens sometimes, like when you look at the paramecium tomorrow. Okay? The paramecium is oval shaped like that. You always want to measure its length or size on its longest dimension. Okay? All right, so that's how we estimate the size. Very hard? No, it's easy. Okay. All right, so we already have this on those diagrams. The field of view for the scanning lens is 4,000 micrometers. The field of view for the low power lens is 1,600 micrometers. For the high power lens, 400 micrometers. Okay, we estimate the size of the object. We estimate how many would fit across or how much of the field it takes up. Either one will work, okay? And that'll give us our size. Okay, I want you guys to get some answers to these questions. Okay, and I'm going to get the Chromebooks out, and we're going to do the pre-lab stuff for the lab after that. So I'm going to give you a few minutes to get some complete sentence answers down for those questions there. All right, let's have a look at these. So uh, what are the three points of the cell theory? Point number one is all organisms are made up of cells. I would accept all living things are also made up of cells. Okay, something along those lines. Point number two, what do cells do? 
Right. They perform the basic functions, carry out the basic functions of the organism. Okay. And the third thing, where do cells come from? The division of an existing cell. Right. Cells come from the division of an existing cell. Okay. Uh, who are the four people considered to be the most important in the development of the cell theory? What did they do? Okay. First person, Hook. What did he do? Discovered cells by creating the microscope. Okay. Um, and then second person? Anton von Leeuwenhoek, okay, and uh, guys, you just need last names, so Leeuwenhoek would be fine. Um, so he looked at, right, so he looked at, basically the cells he looked at were living. Yeah, that was the big difference. He looked at living cells, found that cells were very, very common, okay, and then the two Swedish guys, Schleiden and Schwann, okay, and they proposed the original cell theory. Okay, so as long as we know those, okay, that'll be good. And then on what basis can we deduce that plants and animals may have had a common ancestor? Well, not yet. Structure of the cells and not just structure, but also right, the way they carry out their basic functions. A lot of the cellular processes are the same, with the exception of the big one. That is, one is photosynthetic and one has to eat other organisms. But okay, other than that, they have a lot more similarities than they have differences. All right, so that's what we need for that one. Okay, we'll leave that at we'll leave that there, and we'll get to work on the pre-lab stuff for the microscopy lab. So if you can come on up here and grab a Chromebook, we'll get started on that.